First, though, David Eastman is never going to encourage a populist movement in support of his innocence. It seems he's a hard man to like, especially by judges and juries. And since being convicted of the murder of police chief Colin Winchester, David Eastman has been in dispute with virtually everyone, including his own lawyers. He's constantly argued, though, his innocence, and his protestations have struck a chord with some. So, we all know the case against Eastman. Jeremy Thompson tonight investigates whether there's a case to be mounted for him. Completely innocent. Federal police frame up. It's my view that this is a more broadly based miscarriage of justice than the Chamberlain matter. I have never been satisfied that anybody has proven his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Australian Federal Police Assistant Commissioner Colin Winchester was shot twice in the head as he parked his car in a driveway adjoining his home on a warm January night in 1989. It was a murder that transfixed and horrified the national capital and, some say, a case far too complex for a local police force with little experience in solving a well-planned and premeditated murder. Jack Waterford, the Canberra Times editor-at-large and a qualified lawyer, has closely followed the case since the very night of the murder. It was not the Australian Federal Police at its best. Rather than cut out a crime scene and exhaustively analyse it, within hours there were almost certainly scores of policemen walking all over it. Even the coroner walked all over the crime scene. He claimed offensively afterwards that he'd been told that it was all right. It was not long before suspicion fell on former Treasury official David Eastman. Eastman is, by most accounts, highly intelligent but mentally ill. He was Ducks of Canberra Grammar in the early 1960s, but later dismissed from the public service for unstable behaviour. And he had a grievance against Colin Winchester. He wanted to get back into the public service, but could not because he had an assault charge hanging over his head. He went with a senior Liberal politician to see Winchester to ask that the charge be dropped. Winchester heard him out and then said politely, well, if what you say is true, you'll be acquitted, but I'm not going to interfere with the, uh, the prosecution of the case, so it will go ahead in court. And Eastman was quite livid with, um, with Winchester. But this is where the case against Eastman begins to get murky. Terry O'Donnell was Eastman's lawyer at the beginning of his trial back in 1995. There was a witness who gave evidence that Eastman had made a threat uh, against Colin Winchester, uh, a doctor. His original statement to the police made on tape is nothing like the evidence he gave at trial. And yet he was never um, challenged as to why his version at trial was so different from the version that he first gave to the police. The erratic David Eastman sacked Mr O'Donnell after the first day of the trial. That was a pattern that was to become familiar and must have jeopardised his case. Although it was never found, the murder weapon was identified through the spent shells found at the murder scene. It was a .22 Ruger automatic rifle, sold by Queanbeyan gun dealer Louis Clarenbeck. Mr Clarenbeck was gravely ill during the inquest of 1990, but was adamant Eastman was not the buyer. He gave evidence to a bed, hospital bedside hearing to Coroner Carl and said directly to the coroner that David Eastman was not the person who purchased the gun. But the most damning evidence against Eastman were the traces of gunpowder of the same type used in the murder in the boot of his car. Eastman was never able to explain how the propellant got there and he said he never owned a gun. The cartridge cases that were found at the crime scene were PMC brand cartridge cases and the propellant that was found on Mr Winchester's body and in his car was PMC propellant. PMC propellant was found in David Eastman's boot and Eastman was asked to explain how that could be and he could give no explanation. Eastman claimed that he'd never had a gun in his car and accordingly he couldn't account for it, but it looked very suspicious. In a purely circumstantial case, this discrepancy must have been of enormous significance to the jury. Evidence that has lain dormant and unnoticed for 17 years has now come to light. And it's evidence that may well explain just how the powder residue got into the boot of David Eastman's car. 
It all began in 1995, here at what used to be the Belconnen Remand Centre, when the by now reinstated lawyer Terry O'Donnell went to visit his client. David Eastman had just been sentenced to life imprisonment. I went to the Belconnen Remand Centre and a, a tall and rather anxious man came up to me and he said, if I had carried a gun in David Eastman's car, would that be significant? And I said, yes, it certainly would. And he handed me a piece of paper at that time, which had written on it his name and address and telephone number, uh, and Berno.22 and three brands of ammunition, PMC, uh, CCI and RWS. And uh, he told me that he'd carried um, a rifle in Eastman's car without Eastman knowing about it. But when Eastman, using foul language, dismissed the informant, Mr O'Donnell forgot about the piece of paper. That is, until recently. He stumbled across it in a box of papers, rang the number, and the man turned out to be a teacher, an old housemate of Eastman's, and someone who'd borrowed the car to go shooting rabbits, and used the same sort of ammunition that matched the gunshot residue in the car. Now that explanation is, is quite clear, that it could have easily have come from the .22 burner that was carried in Eastman's car in around about 1987. That's important uh, new evidence. That is important new evidence, but it has been held in the ACT Supreme Court that under a, a unique ACT law, you only get one bite of the cherry so far as getting an independent inquiry is concerned. What that means is no matter what new evidence comes to light, David Eastman is not entitled to have his case reopened, even if the evidence proves him not guilty. The ACT is the only state or territory in the Commonwealth which has this provision, described by Jack Waterford as bizarre and unjust. The only person able to order an inquiry is Attorney General Simon Corbell. Do you think that's likely to happen? Well, Corbell is not a lawyer and he has been a very timid Attorney General and he's particularly uh, relies closely on advice from the Director of Public Prosecutions and the police in matters like this. In other words, the very same law enforcement arms that prosecuted David Eastman in the first place. But if we're to believe David Eastman did not do it, then who did? The answer may lie in a bizarre sting operation the AFP conducted in the early 1980s. Colin Winchester entered into an officially sanctioned alliance with an informant, said to be a member of the Italian Mafia, to grow marijuana crops at Bungendorf. The aim was to entrap the drug lords, those who dealt and sold the valuable crop. He had played a major role in the management of some crops run by Sicilian Mafia people out of Bungendor. The case had involved the federal police having a double agent working amongst the, um, the Mafia people and, if you like, running the operation until the police sort of turned the tables on the parties and, and charged them all. So the men who thought they were being protected by Colin Winchester must have felt betrayed. My view is that there was a conspiracy to murder Colin Winchester, which was a direct result of the Bungendore crops, and those who were involved in the conspiracy were part of the Calabrian Mafia, the Andrangheta. Uh, if that's the case, then David Eastman had nothing to do with it. Add to that the manner of the murder, the two gunshots to the head, the so-called double tap, the calling card of the professional hitman. It's been described as the perfect double tap and the killing took about eight seconds. Is he the sort of person that would be able to do the double tap, do you think? No. No, I don't think so. Eastman, there was a lot of verbal violence in Eastman, but uh, I think personally that he was very much the physical coward and the um, you know, somewhat disorganised person. The one man who can order a full investigation, Attorney General Simon Corbell, did not respond to our requests for an interview. In the meantime, David Eastman, after 17 years, remains in jail. The average time for murder before parole in Australia is little more than 11 years. I think he was an easy target and um, the police didn't bother to properly investigate those with the true motive to murder Winchester. I have this nagging worry that there's an innocent man who's been in jail for 17 years and he's not just 
if you like, an innocent man in that circumstance, but he's a mentally ill man whose condition has deteriorated in jail and it's a great blot on our system if that cannot be corrected. The saga continues. Jeremy Thompson was some of the perceived flaws in the case against David Eastman. 